Welcome to the first of our Holy Week reflections. And we're going to hear of Jesus entering the temple courts. In Matthew, Mark and Luke's account of Jesus clearing the temple, this happens the day after he's arrived in Jerusalem, the triumphal entry where folk have welcomed him as King and Messiah. In John's gospel, it happens towards the beginning of his ministry. But here I'm going to read from Mark's account. The next day, as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. Seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to find out if it had any fruit. When he reached out, when he reached it, he found nothing but leaves because it was not the season for figs. Then he said to the tree, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard him say it. On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple area and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. He would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. And as he taught them, he said, is it not written, my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations? But you have made it a den of robbers. The chief priests and the teachers of the law heard this and began looking for a way to kill him. For they feared him because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. I want to ask you two questions. What are you passionate about? What are you passionate about? It might be family, friends, hobby, cooking, football team. What are you passionate about? And the second question is, when did you last get angry? When did you last get angry? And for some of us, that's quite uncomfortable because what we got angry about or who we were angry about causes us some discomfort and upset. But that day when Jesus entered the temple courts, he was passionate and angry. He stood in the place where all people, all people from all nations should be able to meet and to pray to his heavenly father. And there he saw people buying and selling animals for sacrifice, exchanging, having to exchange money for temple coins, but it, doing it both at extortionate rates. People were earning money and earning far too much money for selling and exchanging. Profit had pushed out prayer and greed replaced godliness. Jesus was always and is always on the side of the marginalized and the poor, those who are downtrodden and outcast. So that's why he cleared the temple that day. Jesus is still for the poor and the marginalized, those who are downtrodden and outcast. And even days away from his own agonies and his own death, he was still fighting against injustice. Where do you see injustice? Where do you see people marginalized and outcast and downtrodden in the world today? For some of us, we don't need to look very far. And as followers of Jesus, we're called to be on their side, to be passionate 
and to be angry about what's happening to them. And in a, in a sense, allowing Jesus to live in us and through us to make the difference. What are you going to be passionate and angry about today? Let's pray together. Loving God, may we be a people of passionate prayer. May we be angry when we encounter injustice. Move us into action when we see poverty. Create within us a deep passion and a desire for all people to know and to experience your transforming love. Challenge us to use the talents and the gifts you have given us to bring about your kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. Drive us to our knees in prayer for the discernment and courage to do your will. We bring to mind those who are encountering injustice, those who are downtrodden, those who are pushed to the side and forgotten about. We bring them now to you in this moment of silence. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you were passionate and angry and injustice and that people's lives were changed and transformed because of that passion and anger. May we have the same passion and anger when we encounter injustice. And may your kingdom come here on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So the reflection today is based on a passage in Luke, Luke 20, verses 20 to 26, called Taxes for Caesar. Watching for their opportunity, the leaders sent spies pretending to be honest men. They tried to get Jesus to say something that could be reported back to the Roman governor so that he would arrest Jesus. Teacher, they said, we know that you speak and teach what is right and are not influenced by what others think. You teach the way of God truthfully. Now tell us, is it right for us to pay taxes to Caesar or not? He saw through their trickery and said, show me a Roman coin. Whose picture and title are stamped on it? Caesar's, they replied. Well then, he said, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and give to God what belongs to God. So they failed to trap him by what he said in front of the people. Instead, they were amazed by his answer and became silent. So in this passage, Jesus is continuing to have conversations with both his followers and the religious leaders in and around the Jewish temple, was at the, which was at the heart of Jewish society. These leaders are doing their very best to try and discredit him and get him into trouble by catching him out by him saying something wrong. They want to do this, in my opinion, because they hate him and it justifies their hate. And also because what he says highlights their sin in their lives and also their lack of understanding about faith. This particular conversation is around whether or not you should pay your taxes to Caesar or whether you should follow only God. The Jewish leaders seem to have a very compartmentalised view of the world and also a very narrow view of what faith is. Either you follow God completely and completely reject the law of the land, or you follow the law of the land to the letter, and that means you could never possibly follow God. And so Jesus, in response to this question, gives an answer to them. 
where he asked them for a very specific coin that would have a picture of Caesar's head on it. And he asked them, whose face is on the coin? And they say Caesar. And so his response is, give to Caesar what is his and give to God what is God's. With this answer that he gives, I think he's telling them plainly that our faith is not to be separated and compartmentalised. It's not meant to be that we follow God completely and re reject what the laws of the land are, or we follow the government and the state, but and we don't love God. I think it goes right back to the two most important commandments that Jesus gave us, to love God with our heart, mind, soul and strength, and also to love our neighbour as we love ourselves. I think that Jesus is saying that, yes, we should follow God fully with everything that we have, but that we should also love our neighbour and care about the people and the world around us. We should be obedient to our leaders and follow the laws of the government where we live, but we're to love God first and then we love the people around us. He's saying that we shouldn't put our faith into compartments. I'm not just a Christian once a week on a Sunday and the rest of the time I can be horrible to people and just do and act as I want. And I think if Jesus was here now, he would be living and working amongst the poor and the lost and those that need extra help. But that also at this time of COVID, he'd probably be supporting the government's decision to make us all wear masks and to keep ourselves distanced from other people so that we can protect other people. And I think he probably would be doing that, not because he didn't love and trust and care about God, but because the way that we demonstrate that love for God is the way that we treat the people around us. Our faith should influence what kind of employee or boss that we are, what kind of parent or friend we are, what kind of neighbour we are, and it should be part and parcel of our everyday life. So let's pray together. Dear Lord, help us each day to be intentional about putting you first and loving you first whilst at the same time loving our friends and our neighbours and our community around us. Amen. Welcome to today's reflection. On Holy Wednesday, we're invited to think about Jesus, the humble servant. Our gospel reading comes from Luke 20, verses 45 to 47. And I'm reading from the Good News translation. Jesus warns against the teachers of the law. As all the people listened to him, Jesus said to his disciples, Be on your guard against the teachers of the law, who like to walk about in their long robes and love to be greeted with respect in the marketplace who choose the reserved seats in the synagogues and the best places at feasts, who take advantage of widows and rob them of their homes and then make a show of saying long prayers. Their punishment will be all the worse. The leadership styles of the former and current presidents of the United States of America could hardly be more different. The last president prized adulation, paid scant regard to the poor, and on one occasion at least, Bible in hand, infamously faked piety for his own political ends. The new president appears it would seem to be altogether more modest. He's already made bold moves to address the poverty gap and his rather different political aspirations spring from a lifetime of public service and honest faith. In today's verses from Luke's Gospel, Jesus has harsh words for religious leaders whose love of privilege has become more important than serving and pleasing God. This love of privilege, Jesus warned, can 
warns us can show itself in all kinds of different ways, in an overriding desire for recognition, in taking economic advantage of those who are weaker than us, and in religious observance that's really designed to impress. All such behaviour is a very far cry from the clarion call of the prophet Micah to do justice, to love mercy and to walk humbly with our God. The teachers of the law, the very people who above all should have taken that biblical command to heart, have gravely breached the trust that was placed in them. Their punishment, says Jesus, will be all the worse for that. Tomorrow and Friday, we will be keeping company with Jesus in the upper room and at Calvary. At these sacred scenes, God's alternative style of leadership is made abundantly clear to us. The Jesus who took the towel and went to the cross demonstrates vividly the leadership of one who came not to be served, but to serve. Humility and service are the hallmarks of authentic Christian discipleship. Whether we have a, a leadership role at church, at work, in the family, or simply in the quiet example that we set through the way we go about our everyday lives, there are challenges for all of us in today's Gospel reading. So let's find a moment today to uncover and examine our deeper motives. And let's ask God to help us to honour more fully the trust God has placed in us as we seek to live out our Christian call to serve our neighbour. Let's share a prayer together. Lord Jesus, thank you that you welcome us as honoured guests whenever we meet in your name. We are humbled and grateful for such gracious hospitality. As we follow you this holy week, renew your way of self-giving in us, we pray. Lord Jesus, Servant King, as we journey deeper with you, grant us that compassionate self-knowledge that helps us to change. May we give our lives and all the leadership roles we have as daily offerings of worship and service. For your name's sake we pray. Amen. Welcome everyone to this Monday Thursday Reflection. I'm Clive Jennings. I'm one of the ministers at Christchurch in Clevedon. It's great to be with you today. Our reading is taken from Luke 22, 14 to 20, and it's from the Message Version. When it was time, Jesus sat down with all the apostles with him and said, you've no idea how much I've looked forward to eating this Passover meal with you before I enter my time of suffering. It's the last one I'll eat until we all eat it together in the kingdom of God. Taking the cup, he blessed it, then said, take this and pass it among you. As, as for me, I'll not drink wine again until the kingdom of God arrives. Taking bread, he blessed it, he broke it, and he gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. Eat it in my memory. 
He did the same with the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant written in my blood, blood poured out for you. I just want you to imagine that I have invited you round for a meal. And uh, as we're all seated round, I'm gonna start off by saying, um, oh, by the way, uh, one of you is gonna betray me. Oh, and also as well, um, I'm gonna be arrested soon. There'll be a sham trial. I'm gonna be beaten, I'm gonna be flogged, and you will all scatter. You will leave me. All by Peter, of course. Peter tried hard. Peter gets such a bad press. I feel really sorry for Peter. At least he tried, maybe working through a rescue package in his mind. And then what they're going to do is they're going to crucify me. And that's the way it has to be. Mm, great dinner party, you may think. It's amazing that Jesus uses these words, isn't it? Uh, the fact, you've no idea how much I've looked forward to eating this Passover meal with you before I enter my time of suffering. Jesus knew that something had to be broken in order for new life to come. You know, so often we get used to those words in communion, don't we? Maybe uh, we've taken them for granted. You know, this is my body broken for you. So often things have to be broken in order for something new to come from it. You know, eggs. I love eggs. I love a, I love a, an omelette. It's great. Just cracking eggs. To, you know, we have to open a shell to find the beauty of a pearl, you know. Um, but seriously, some things have to be broken in order for new life to come. You know that. I know that as well. Addictions, habits, abusive relationships, breaking away, um, being unkind to one another, unkind words, things in our character, things that have to be broken in order for new life to come. I'm not sure that disciples really got it. You know, they didn't know that Easter Sunday was on the horizon. They didn't know that death would be beaten, that there would be fresh hope, that there would be new life listening to these words of Jesus and then everything that followed in the few hours to come must have been so difficult. We are privileged, privileged that we know, yet often we take scripture and this day so much for granted. So maybe as we reflect this day on the pain of that meal, the days that followed when brokenness for some, seemed like hopelessness. And maybe that's where we can connect with many in our community at this time, where brokenness seems like hopelessness. Yet we have a message to bring, that God loved the world so much that he sent his only son. Why? So that we can have life in all its fullness. Would you pray with me? Lord, on this evening, when for the disciples all seemed lost and maybe hopeless as they move forward, would you draw us to those in our community, Lord, who are feeling like that at the moment? And Lord, may we too deal with the things within ourselves, in our character, that need to be broken in order to have a closer and deeper relationship with you, where you can meet with us. We pray for those today that you would meet those where they are to help them in the healing power of your Holy Spirit. So Lord, bless us this day. May we know your peace and your presence. And Lord, as we hear those words, this is my body, broken for you. Lord, may we give thanks in our hearts for all that you have done for us in order to bring us that new life. Amen.
The Crucifixion of Jesus from Luke's Gospel, chapter 23 and starting at verse 26. As the soldiers led him away, they seized Simon from Cyrene, who was on his way in from the country, and put the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. A large number of people followed him, including women who mourned and wailed for him. Jesus turned and said to them, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me. Weep for yourselves and for your children. For the time will come when you will say, Blessed are the childless women, the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. For if people do these things when the tree is green, what will happen when it's dry? Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, they crucified him there, along with the criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching and the rulers even sneered at him. They said he saved others. Let him save himself if he's God's Messiah, the chosen one. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, if you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above him which read, This is the King of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you're under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we're getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. So what's so good about Good Friday? We followed the events of the final week of Jesus' life We've seen the servant heart of Jesus. We know the murderous determination of the religious leaders. And it's clear where this is all heading. So the ruler of the universe, our leader, our king, our greatest hope, the one we claim to be the savior of the world, died on this day in history. And we say it's a good day. Well, yes. Good Friday is a good day because this is no ordinary man and it was no ordinary thing that he did. It's a good day for all of us because on this day Jesus Christ made the ultimate sacrifice and he finished what he was here on earth to do. With infinite generosity he gave his life. He hung on the cross and saying with his final breath, it is finished, he died. All that God his Father had sent him to do, he accomplished. And that's why Good Friday is a good day. It's a very special day because without the crucifixion, there would be no resurrection. And without the resurrection, there would be no Christianity. And you see, without Friday, there would be no Sunday. Good Friday is good because as terrible as that day was, it was God's good plan and purpose that it would happen in that way, on that day. And Jesus' willingness to give, give and give until it was impossible to give any more, the ultimate generosity of Jesus has made it possible for us to enjoy an intimate relationship with a loving and gracious God. That's why 
It's a good day. Let's pray. We thank you, Father, for Jesus. We thank you for his sacrifice and his obedience, for his willingness to give all that he had, even his very life. And we thank you that his generosity has made it possible for us to enjoy the knowledge of your love and your grace. Thank you, Father. Amen. Luke 23, verses 50 to 56, the burial of Jesus. Now there was a man named Joseph, a member of the council, a good and upright man who had not consented to their decision and action. He came from the Judean town of Arimathea, and he himself was waiting for the kingdom of God. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body. Then he took it down, wrapped it in linen cloth, and placed it in a tomb cut in the rock, one in which no one had yet been laid. It was preparation day, and the Sabbath was about to begin. The women who had come with Jesus from Galilee followed Joseph and saw the tomb and how his body was laid inside. Then they went home and prepared spices and perfumes. But they rested on the Sabbath in obedience to the commandment. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. One of my favourite TV dramas of all time is Inspector Morse, closely followed by its sequel, Lewis. I could watch the same episodes over and over again. In fact, I have. I never get bored with them, and that's because I just love the characters, I love the drama, I love the story. But for all my enjoyment of watching repeats of those programmes, the experience is never quite as special as seeing them for the first time. The power of a really great story will be such that we're gripped by it, even though we know what happens in the end. But such stories are never quite so powerful as the first time we hear them, because it's then that we really enter into the story and we're engaged by the suspense of not knowing how things will turn out. When we read the Gospels, we must be aware of our familiarity with them. We know that Jesus did not stay in the grave, that out of his death came resurrection. But the first disciples didn't. I think that's why Holy Saturday, the day between Good Friday and Easter Sunday, is so important in the overall narrative. Our problem today is that we simply leap from the Friday to the Sunday without properly pausing between the two. In so doing, we bypass that block of time that in many ways was the most painful for the disciples. Jesus had died and he'd been buried. That first Saturday must have been agonizing. It must have seemed so much longer than a single day. To discover the power of the Easter story, we need to approach it not as a story whose ending we already know, but as though we were watching it unfold for the first time. Only then can we be brought close to the experience of the earliest followers of Jesus, for whom, more than for anyone else in history, reality was turned completely upside down. So on this day, let's allow the message of Good Friday to really, really linger. Take stock deeply of what happened on the cross because it's when we find ourselves right there in that place of utter bewilderment and devastation that we need to hear that message that God is about to do something truly amazing. Let's pray. 
Lord God, on this day, we remember Jesus in the grave. To most people's eyes, it looked as if it were all over. He was dead and buried. But only as a seed dies when it is planted in the earth, not to decay, but to spring to new life. Teach us to take our refuge in you. Help us to remember that death is not our end. May we always hope in you. And may we be poised for what you are about to do. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.